Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Du Awa Frazier, the host and producer of Nerdocity Podcast. And today on Saturday, we have a wonderful treat. And I'm going to be talking with Dr. Damaris B. Hill about her latest book, Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood. And this is quite a treat because Damaris has seemed to release one book after another. And I'm certainly excited for her and excited to talk with her. So on this um, fifth day of Black History Month, I'm going to um, talk about uh, one of my favorite books um, while we wait for Dr. Hill. And that's the vintage book of African American poetry uh, featuring so many Black poets from uh, past to present, from Harlem Renaissance to Black arts movement, contemporary uh, poets, and so many of our favorites. As you can see, this book for me is pretty well worn as I've been using it to teach over the years. Um, but definitely, if you really want to get an outstanding collection of poetry that is not so recent, uh, but still has so many gems in it, this is one that you definitely want to pick up. Vintage Book of African American Poetry, edited by Michael S. Harper and Anthony Walton. And I am going to pick up with Dr. Damaris B. Hill right now. Want to make sure um, we have her fully invited and bring her up. Well, hello there. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm happy doing, to Dr. see Hill? you. Happy to I'm see fine, you too. I'm fine, thank you. You look like you're in your office. Are you in your office? I am not in my office. I'm in a colleague's office oh. <laughs> because um, we're, uh, me and some of my colleagues are actually working on a play that um, takes some of the content for 400 Souls and dramatizes it. Wonderful. Um, yeah, this is my first time in the theater environment as a writer. Oh, and yes. this is our, um, I, I guess, like our full reading. Okay. Yeah, but I, I said I had things to do, so I had to go. Hello, we're on that <laughs> tour, honey. I was looking at your website, and I'm like, you are booked up. And that's a great it's thing. Um, and so I want to congratulate you on your latest book, Dr. Hill, Breath Thank Better you. Spent, Living Black Girlhood. It's such a beautiful book. There's so much in it. Um, it has to be read several times. Um, to get the layers and meaning and understanding and, and the how you put yourself in the book, but then how you also highlighted and spotlighted the lives of others throughout your poetry, which I found very um, touching. I was like, all the references you made, I was like, let me see, do I have that book? You made a reference to Incidents of the Life of the Slave Girl. And this is one of my favorites to Harriet Jacobs in one of your poems. And I was like, wow, she is just calling out, calling out to so many different women. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, what was it like for you to um, switch from A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, which was released 2019, and you and I had a great discussion on that. And then now to um, the discussion in Poetic Form of Black girlhood and um, Black women and the whole journey and experience of what what those rites of passages are like for us. I'm back are you yeah, there? I'm back in. I don't know what happened, but I'm back in. So we do have an ice storm here in Lexington, so I don't know if that is affecting our connection. So I did hear your last question. So the last question was, how did I transition from a bound woman to this? Yes. Um. Well, I love Black women. Let's start there. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I've been writing about girlhood a lot in different areas. 
And I started thinking more about the public school to prison pipeline and um, the arrest of girls and, and increase in suspension. So like 16% of public school girls are, are black girls. 50% mm -hmm. of school suspensions are black girls. Wow. So I'm talking about this, this kind of cultural look at disciplining black girls that I think reflects a national consciousness um, yeah. that I think does extend into womanhood, right? But it comes with some of these assumptions that we have about hierarchy and who is important in our society and why. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Who is important in our society and why? And um, I was interested in how you talked about that in your introduction. Um, you talked about the connection with breath and, you know, as Black girls mm -hmm. go through their lives, how every bit of breath that is shared with us, whether through, you know, jokes, conversation, gossip, secrets it's all being absorbed we're all we're learning from it and we're getting um you know we're getting some of what the rules are and what the rules ain't so to <laughs> speak and we're getting those codes about you know how are we to live and how are we to process and and, and digest the things that are going on outside of ourselves and how others react to us and i really appreciated your discussing that with so much um, heart, you know, I just was like, wow, she is amazing to be able to really go there, um, especially during this time, you know, when it seems our pain is connected to what we're seeing outside of ourselves, uh, not so much having a vehicle to really express um, as we normally do as writers getting on the podium or being at bookstores and things like that in person the pandemic has somewhat, you know, hindered those things. Um, so I, I also wanted to ask you about, once again, probably a question I asked you in our previous interview, how were you able to dig deep and to pull these stories out of yourself and remembrances in such a painful and traumatic time? It, it was hard. Like there was nothing easy about this book. This book matured me, grew me, um, connected me to, you know, back to my childhood self and to a collective black girlhood self in ways that I did not expect. What you think is, what you think the journey your book is gonna take is never the journey in it ways, takes. I'm sorry. It always does what, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry, it may have deviated, but um, this, this book matured me and grew me in ways that I did not anticipate at all. It took me on journeys and created intimacies between my old self and my future self and the generations and collective Black girlhood that I did not envision or imagine mm. when I initially thought of this book. And so it was it was a lot of work. You know, I can really see that and feel that. And when you say collective black girlhood, as I'm going through your book and I pinpointed certain poems that I was really feeling and really visualizing, you know, you um you talk about uh Ma Rainey. You know, we of course we had the recent movie on uh Ma, Ma Rainey's uh Black Bottom the birth of Ma, and it's, mm -hmm. while it's a short poem, it's vivid and it's, and it's, and it really grips you. Um, I feel like you're taking us through the girlhood of so many women and at the same time yourself, you know, never grow old for Aretha Franklin. And then, you know, of course we have a quote by Zora Neale Hurston and I was waiting for that. When we got to page <laughs> 23, I'm like, where is the patron saint of, you know, black girlhood and, and <laughs> woman speak? And, you know, I'm looking for Zora Neale Hurston and you had her here. Um, and then you touch on, you know, Whitney Houston. And I feel both a sadness, but also a pride in, you know, Whitney Houston was ours. And I felt that you reclaiming <laughs> her 
um, and giving her that humanity and saying, you know, she, she is a black girl. She was a black girl too. But I also mm -hmm. wonder, Damaris, in your highlighting other women in their lives, are you, are you alluding to that they were, despite fame and fortune, that they were unprotected too? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if they were unprotected. But what I do know is that the United States of America inherited a social culture that privileges wealthy, white, for lack of a better term, men, right? Mm -hmm. I do know that inheritances don't belong to women in such cultures. I do know that power to negotiate space outside of the household does not belong to women in such cultures. I do know in the hierarchies of national priorities of cultures that reflect those, those hierarchies and um, notions of who and what is important, I know always that children are at the bottom of that list, still oh. legally, Killing a child is not can can has a very tricky um, civic negotiation in terms of value and worth, mm. right? So there is always in a capitalist culture a commodification of the body, and considering the intersections of race, gender, age, socioeconomic status it would reason that black girls are considered less valuable in a commodified system. Mm. But the purpose of this book is to illustrate the ways that black girls are not commodities, but are actually wealth, period. Mm -hmm. The culture that, the things that we will pay for in our culture, music, uh, fashion, um, lingo, style, a lot of that comes, not exclusively, but a lot of it comes from insular black girl communities and looking, of new, looking for new ways to negotiate and express ourselves under these assumptions that some of us are not willing to, um, to simply um, go along with. Yes, indeed. And I wrote down some lines that really struck me. On page 18 of your book, you say, we wear our smiles like trophies. And I know you're referring to yourself and I believe your friend. No, it was um, my cousin. I was cousin. writing about my cousin. Um, it mm -hmm. makes me think about what do you think, Damaris, of the idea that, you know, we somehow early in life also get the understanding that, you know, you're supposed to smile through your pain as well. Smile through joy, but smile through pain and not never let others see you in pain as much as you possibly can. And the whole notion of, you know, I've heard over and over, you know, black people don't feel pain. Black women have a high tolerance for pain. Um, and that makes mm -hmm. me think about the way we wear our smiles like trophies. Such, such a girlhood, um, gesture but at the same time i feel that carries almost you know throughout your life throughout your womanhood um, and what i like you what you think i like what you're saying here and what it's making me think about is not just um the ways that women and particularly black women are conditioned in a society like ours to uh mask our pain as 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 a sense of satisfaction or pleasure for the convenience of others that benefit from our exploitation slash pain right mm -hmm. but i'm in that particular way i'm talking about a type of black girl pleasure that only our race and us together matter us, mm -hmm. us pretending to be these Olympians matter. And that's a type of joy. But you're getting at a greater question that I asked throughout the book. 
and what kinds of social conditionings and social preparedness and social trainings do black girl experience do black girls experience that lead them to a type of conditioning to be okay and to willingly be exploited that is a lot of the question that i'm asking in the book so you definitely picked up on that right mm -hmm. and so i'm asking all of the ways that black girls in particular are told this is how to act this is how to be this is how to do it's showing up in the statistics about what black girls are being punished for in schools right um yeah. such so things like cutting their eyes at other girls which is a form of communication and black girl code like look i've had enough right right <laughs> <laughs> and it's our way of saying like i've had enough you know your, not your, grandma, your grandmama used to do that to you when you were little or your 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 great aunt or someone right no. <laughs> right it's a signifier it's a gesture mm -hmm. not a threat not a threat it's saying the border is here now it may imply that if you cross the border with the wrong person it may lead to some type of unanticipated physical violence but that's not what rolling the eyes um means in absolute right sure mm -hmm. or cutting the eyes right and so i wanted to kind of focus on that and you were talking a lot about the 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 um, Aretha Franklin portion of the book, which is what are you, what you talking about, which is like a series of eight poems. Right. And I'll just read the eighth poem because we don't really have time to go through all eight. But you know, I got to put my grown girl eyes on. Hold on. Yes, yes. And I and I'm so sorry <laughs> I didn't say okay. Give us a poem because I'm so fascinated. <laughs> That's okay. And here I am acting like, okay, Damaris, we about to really go through this. But you know what? Yes. Yes. Let's please. We do please. need to go through it because, I mean, this is a hard book for, for hard conversations yeah. about retraining ourselves to think about um, the individual and collective agency that Black girls have in our culture. It's a really hard conversation because this means parents have to recognize that black girls have desires that may exceed their expectations. You know, teachers have to think about the individual humanity of black girls rather than the collective student body in a way. But I'll, I'll read, I'll read um, eight on page 32 from what you're talking about, because okay. I think a part of this poem kind of sums up what I'm trying to say about black girls in, in our language. Black girl, all, you're welcome. Black girl, all of this will want to carve you. Black girl, do not hollow your heart. Black girl, make room for a melody and shimmy. Black girl, with your ragged teeth, chip out some space for the lamp in your throat. Black girl, torched by the sacred voice of Aretha Franklin, you, black girl, carry only your load and do not grow weary of your heap. Black girl of hope and sorrow, your voice is a burning bush. Black girl, ignite every rock of fear in your belly. They always telling you, black girl, to be a lady, but no, but no one prepares you to be a woman. Mm. Yes. And so, like, what I'm trying to talk about there is all of the ways we prepare black girls to be exploitable and to expect a reward of praise and a reward of tolerance and a reward of acceptance into this society. But in what part of that training do we learn how to be individuals and adults? Exactly. Um, and I appreciate this so much. I want to say to you before I forget, your book, if you're a Black woman who reads this book, not I mean, this book is for everyone because you know all women have a girlhood. However, as a black woman reading this book, I feel the call to remember uh, my own stories and memories. And it's almost like you cannot remember the laughter. Um, you cannot remember the laughter and the girlhood jokes and secrets and, and you know, 
the gestures and signifying and gossip without also remembering, as you mentioned, you know, black girl to be a lady, but no one prepares you to be a woman about the rough parts of just your passage, um, you know, in, ver in various ways into your, you know, your womanhood or into, you know, understanding how you're perceived uh, by others, you know, and or how you're expected to behave because you're a black female, a black woman. Um, and so I really felt, you know, as I'm reading, I'm so enjoying, but it's also, it's touching something in me. It's asking me a question, Duewa, about her girlhood as well and what surrounds assumptions, expectations, passages, and those things. Um, I mm -hmm. just wanted to mention that with and with nothing else, just putting it out there. Well, you you know, I'm always about making space for us to be free and to challenge that. And like, it's a part of like, girlhood is not limited to age, right? But I think what you're really talking about, Duwan, we don't have to talk about it anymore in detail. But when black girls transition from the from the safe enclaves of other black girls into a social world that the hierarchies of society are ever present. And then there might be um, people that have different intersectional identities than we do that have been conditioned and trained to not um, look at black girls and black women as very, uh, very strong social and intellectual strategists just because every time we enter the world it's such a complex negotiation between race gender and age mm -hmm. and that builds a certain type of strategic mind mm -hmm. and so of course when we enter um social spaces or professional spaces or even competitive spaces that type of strategic agency that we've had to have for ourselves probably since age three or whatever the self-consciousness and awareness was is present serena williams is present wow I love the hearts. I'm not going to read the chat because, you know, I'll stop talking. <laughs> but thank yeah. you for the love. You're getting a lot of hearts. Oh, yeah. Um, and feel free, uh, those who are joining us, thank you so much. Again, this is Due Wa Frazier, and I'm talking with Dr. Damaris V. Hill, author of the new book, Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood. Please, if you're not already following her, please follow her here on Instagram and thank you for enjoying this talk and please give us your comments as well either here or in the direct message we appreciate mm -hmm. it um, and Dr. Hill do you have another poem okay one more thing I want to know on page 19 when you said worse uh, you were you were hurt and you said uh -huh. worse like a like a girl I cry mm -hmm. what did you mean by that I want to I mean I I, like a girl, I cry. Because I'm asking, who else mm -hmm. would you be crying at that, t at that point, in that moment? I, I, think, I think at that moment, um, in, in my life, in my experiences, boys received a lot of praise. And boys have their own conditioning about how to be men. But I didn't really know boys that cried. And so if I was going to be accepted and as tough as the guys, then I, I shouldn't have cried in that moment. Mm. Right? Like I should have found a way to, to, to swallow it and suppress it. Do I, hold on one second. There is, there is somebody at this office door that doesn't belong to me. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're on a podcast. I know, I know, I know, I know. Hi. The other left? Oh. Herman, right there. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, Damaris, I also want to say 
I love your beautiful face, but it is frozen, Chow. Is there any oh. way we can get to seeing you live again or? I don't know why it's frozen. It might be this old building. Is it coming back? I mean, I can see your face. I just, but it's in, it's just stayed there as opposed to me us seeing your gesturing and as you're reading what your face looks like and all of that. Okay, I'm moving the camera now. Oh, Hopefully Karima, it's back. Karima Tutat says, I can see you well. well okay, good. Me. So I'm like moving all around. So I was impressed that you couldn't see me. That's great. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll just go with that. As long as you don't disappear, someone else said, Adichie, oh, Adichie, I can mm -hmm. see you right well. Okay, good. Okay. As long as they can see you, we're fine. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's what I was talking about. Like in that in that moment, even though I was pretending to be a champion and I wanted to be a champion, I, I wasn't I, I I didn't see champions as champions as being vulnerable to, to cry. Mm. Right? Yes. Because you were also you were admiring Flojo. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. and right. But seeing her as a champion and not recognizing her girlhood, mm. like somehow internalizing that my black girlhood, that if I express anything associated with my gender, race, or age, then that would equate to being perceived as weak or mm. lesser than. So sure. even at that, that young age, that type of reasoning, which is also like kind of what I'm talking about in Beloved Weirdo in that poem. Like mm -hmm. at age six, how do you realize that you're a slave? What kind of violence must you experience at age six before you know your mother's name? Before you know if you have a last name? Maybe even before you know all the proper names of your body parts. Mm -hmm. What violence do you experience to understand that you're a slave? Exactly. And that's Harry Jacob's girlhood. Mm-hmm. Um, is that what do you want to read next? Um, I I can read. I've I've read that poem a couple of times, but I can read that poem next. Or I was thinking about um, reading um, "Never Grow Old" because it has Aretha in it too. Do you like? What do you want? Do I? That, I like that's all that matters. Um, I like all of them. Uh, how about? Okay. How about Sage Poets and Pop Stars on page 51? Okay. Yes. That, that, that's my good Whitney poem, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of kind of conversations that happen in these poems with uh, other books about Black girlhood. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of them. This talks about Gwendolyn Brooks in the Mecca, which right. is a book that we don't talk about a lot, but it's a book about looking for a black girl in a in a building in Chicago and meeting everyone in the neighborhood and getting their perspectives on the pizza. Wow. All right. Okay. So Sage Poets and Pop Stars. Miss Brooks keeps an eye on you in the Mecca. Her ear to the streets, eyebrow perched like a limb. If you ask a question, you must keep it going. You can't stop there. Worlds will wave, will be facetious. And you fly off the handle, giggle and grab dictionaries and point straight through the S, thumb through the definition when you eye it. Curious through, the, through to the core, you leave the library with questions in your Walkman. How will I know? Finger fluffing your bangs to make them wiggy. You and Whitney wondering what is really love you kissed a couple of boys and their cousins, left fruity sweet lips on the necks of them in choir closets, on baseball fields, and in staircases. You will write love letters religiously to other girls' boyfriends. They are recipes, love sp spells. You say little, three-way calling is mischief. The person on the other end, the gin. Whitney has a voice of rainbows and hums and glitter. How could she feel weak? She tells you falling in love is bittersweet. Crab apples, ripe, foul, and reckless, 
in the arches of your feet. Cicadas sing long distance through phone lines. The lightning bugs are out of the jars, flying about the kitchen. Love comes in sweet tarts, batty boys, finger popping, and passion's doors, affections in Easter colors. They love like mood lipstick. Laughter is the lust you share. They switch, hold hands with bookworms, blow kisses through beauty shop windows, skip when they see mirrors and other mysteries. Mm, beautiful. I think this is one of my favorites. I mean, there's really a lot of them. I love uh, The Never Grow Old. I like The, Bir the Birth of Ma. I love sign of the times because you were making all these references and I'm like this is 80s this is what you know is growing up in the 80s you know um and then I love the photo of Queen Latifah and Moni love you know we all remember Moni in the middle where yeah in the middle and it's just that sisterhood and just how how good they made us feel about themselves because of what they were doing um, and so I appreciate all of these references you're making. Thank um, you. Do you think that in fashioning um, your in your in black girlhood to transforming into your womanhood that we all have somehow had these women that we may not have known that close up they weren't in our families. However, they were like ideal black womanhood to us um do yeah. you feel you know what i mean um yeah and i think i'm going that goes back to that line like you're taught how to be a lady but nobody really tells you how to be a woman so that also becomes a part of the social cultural strategy and coding like you're looking for like what kind of woman you want to be right right you know, it may not, you know, it may not be your mom. You just may have a different personality than your mom, right? Yeah. Or your grandmother or other people you see. You know, a lot of my Black girlhood was spent in church. Mm -hmm. I was not interested in being a church lady until mm -hmm. I'm 60. Then I'm going to go back to church and I'm going to be an usher. That's, <laughs> that, that's the church lady I wanted to be. And you know but, what's interesting? I appreciate you mentioning that because I feel like there's church mentioned throughout in the poems many times, maybe not as in a whole poem about church, but almost mm -hmm. like, you know, church is synonymous with black girlhood. Like it's featured in all of our young lives, you know, in some way, shape or form, whether we were open to it, whether it was forced upon or whether it was just something that family felt you did on a Sunday or what have you. And then before, you know, Sunday dinner, and what have you. Um, mm -hmm. And so what, what is your, what is the place of church in this collection? I think for me and for other people, like religion is always used as a tool to affirm good behavior, particularly good girl behavior, mm -hmm. right? So I think, I think I'm not privileged to know, but I think boys have a different type of training. So I'm going to start with like a type of analogy or metaphor. I did not know till like maybe five years ago that boys or men's pants and shorts have 12 inches worth of pocket. Yeah, look at your face because we get three inches worth of pocket. Yeah, barely no pocket at all. <laughs> right, we don't get any pocket at all. But I think the development of manhood might be very much the same. There are nuances, layers, and depths that they have in their sociocultural training mm -hmm. that we don't have access to. So it may be um, knowledge of finances and negotiating space, but it may be lots of other things. I don't know. But what I will say is that in religious spaces, that are often gendered, we do get to see women negotiating power. And I think religious spaces in that way may feel very safe for grown little black girls. 
Yeah. And therefore, it's a space that we are invited into and that often teaches us uh, social behavior. Whether those grown Black girls believe in the religious dogma or not. It's a space yeah. where they can express beauty without consequence. It's a place where they can negotiate power without consequence. It's a place to perform their gifts where society may not have as many opportunities. Non-religious society. And um, Dr. Hill, I want to ask you about the section in search of the color girl. And you mentioned um, Hmm. No, I'm listening to I'm you. Sorry. I mentioned right in the introduction. Uh, I enjoyed your discussion of uh, visiting the uh, colored uh, color girls museum in uh, is that Philadelphia? Absolutely, Vashti okay. Dubois, the founder and creator, is a genius, and it was just such a nurturing hyper creative, hyper sensory, black girl, indulgent space. Mm -hmm. So like I've at one to, time she I've had to go there. You've got to go. At one time she yeah. had an exhibit that a black woman artist created of a of a prayer closet. What? Whoa. Like what? And like totally okay. had created this whole visual, emotional and spiritual expression of a prayer closet to mimic um, some of those uh, little known um, sanctuaries of black womanhood mm -hmm. and black womanhood culture in the domestic space. Sure. Particularly for women that may have had less social capital and space. That, that prayer closet was a very important space for them because it was how they negotiated injustice and disappointment. Mm -hmm. and, and hope and faith and optimism. That's right. And, you know, I was thinking about um, in the section in the search of uh, the color girl, some of the poems in this section, you are mentioning um, settings and references to the South. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, in terms of Black girlhood, are Black girls or historically, and I, I kind of know the answer, but just, you know, for the sake of our dialogue and your, your collection, are we, is it safe to say, or is it an assumption that Black girlhood, for Black girls growing up in the South, is any different past or pr to present than black girls growing up in the North, in the Northeast, on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Do you? I, I am unsure about that. I want to be clear that I think because of the intersections of age, race, and gender, mm -hmm. that um, black girls are vulnerable in every space in America, in any space, pretty much any space in the world that speaks English. Mm -hmm. um, because we've adopted those bad behaviors, well, those behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, let me try not to be judgy. Um, but I will say this, when it comes to documentation, there is more documentation in the South, but let's be clear. Black girls are murdered in Columbus, Ohio, in Louisville, Kentucky, in Baltimore, Maryland, in Washington, D.C., in New York City, Mm -hmm. all over right and those are the black girls that have some some type of agency to the nationhood or some type of relationship to the nationhood state there are plenty of girls here who don't have names who die right. they may right. die in these immigrant concentration camps that we have here you know, that may die 
undocumented here while working for the benefit of others and mm -hmm. we don't know their names and so we don't know where where their transition from an earthly life into another space is happening mm -hmm. but there's a lot of documentation more so in alabama that i came across in many other places right and i'm thinking about you know camille cupcake mckinney on page 87 you can, mm -hmm. I can read this. Your first line, a black girl ain't safe. There's a period there. But the next words are in Alabama, the clergy, the crazy. But it, it, there's a, for me, my mind goes, oh, a black girl ain't safe in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Even though that's not really how you wrote it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we're getting, we have, you have these poems uh, that reference Birmingham and reference, you know, I thought I saw at least some um, uh, mm -hmm. the photograph of a, a little girl outside a grocery store in Mississippi. And I, you know, whenever I see that, those references historical come back to mind. And then, you mm -hmm. know, so I just wanted to, you know, know your thoughts on that. I think, um, I think, Southern culture, Southern culture in the United States has its own complexities that I don't pretend to know very intimately. I was not raised in the South and I may purposely avoid um, those types of cultural preferences because mm -hmm. they do not suit me. Mm -hmm. There is no benefit to me. Mm -hmm. But I think... Um, I'm not always sure what happens. What I do know is that in a lot of these situations where these girls have been murdered, they have been murdered by people who have already been convicted for hurting young people. Mm. So it mm. says something about access and it says something that we already know that um, jail is not an effective form of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. But I think it kind of, and I think, I want to say I think, right? I think it also speaks to a type of social conditioning and oppression where, where rage is not strategically employed into a space that would result in liberation, but rage um, is weaponized against people that may be physically, psychologically, or socially weaker. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's what I can say about it, right? Mm -hmm. It's a really complex thing. Like, there isn't anything that I'm talking about in the book that I can pretend to understand, you know, in depthly all throughout all the nuances because black mm -hmm. girlhood is a very complex thing. But sure. black girlhood in a collective conversation with national identity or global hegemony, right, is even more complex. True. I can you know, without placing myself or all of the women I know, you know, we're all from different regions. There are certain things in our regions and families and environments that are going to be different. But then as I've read, as I'm reading your collection, but yet there are things that are the same, <laughs> you know, no matter where we're from, um, the questions, some of the experiences, um, you know, I just feel like, wow, you know, we can all, we can be from different regions of the U.S. Uh, as Black women and remember some of the same uh, points in our early lives. And, you know, whether it's the, the physical changes we're going through or the friendships or, you know, encountering um, peers, boys, family expectations. I just feel like some of those are just across the board, I could not know you. And we sit down and discuss some of these things and it's like, yup, 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 that happened to me. Yup, 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 I used to love that song. Yup, I had her posters on my wall too. 
you know, and I just kind of feel like that's the beauty also of um, the unity. And you were talking about Soul Hots and, um, you know, that your work with Soul Hot and uh, Dr. Ruth, um, um, I know, and I know her name, um, who, who created it. And I was really, um, say that again. Dr. Ruth Nicole Brown. Yes, Ruth Nicole Brown, you know, and I was really enjoying that, just like um, you're discussing your work and the impact of volunteering uh, with the organization. I thought that was really great. Yeah, I mean, all of those experiences kind of expanded me and reassured um, reassured my Black girlhood identity and and how okay it was for that Black girlhood identity to be present in my everyday life right now. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it was like so hot and Ruth Nicole Brown's theories about Black girlhood and creativity. But it was also being with the Urban Bush women and we're talking about activism and how activism starts with the self. And when you really start to examine um, where in your life you started to be complicit in your own subjugation. Mm -hmm. For me, it's it may have started in girlhood. And there was a time, and I've said it in other interviews, like, you know, let's be clear, there are a lot of pastors in my family. Like, a lot of people have MDivs. They are all taking the expressway to heaven. I'm taking wow. the senior route. So I'm there's not, a pastor you know, hill in your family? There are many. My wow. dad, my grandfather, my mother, my uncles. Like, wow. yeah. One of my That's uncles amazing. used to run a seminary. Mm. Like, many. Mm -hmm. Many, right? Many, yeah. many, many, many. Um, My son's godmother, one of my high school best friends, is now a pastor of a huge church. Mm. And we, we always laugh and joke about that. Wow. Um, but when you're in that type of church environment and maybe um, Black girlhood is already hyper-visualized, right? Yeah. Um, particularly in, in terms of sexuality, but because of the social position and of my parents, particularly my father, my Black girlhood was very hyper-visualized, not always sexualized, but um, the politics of physical appearance yeah. were a part of the indoctrination of respectability. Sure. And not only reinforced by my nuclear family, but by my extended family, and even more so by our community. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of Black girls have experienced that. And so by the time I was like 12 or 13, I refused. I loved a dress, right? I love femininity, but I was not into wearing a dress to church anymore. And I think mm -hmm. that was like the first ways of figuring out like how this type of indoctrination wasn't working for me. So yeah. I would wear like dress pants suits or culottes, but like. And and it probably was related to I used to really like mini skirts. It's probably related to the length of my skirts. Exactly. Like just, <laughs> Cause they say you need that. a prayer cloth, you need a um, you know, a cloth, you know. Right. And you know, in Methodist churches, we do a lot of kneeling at the altar, like stuff don't really happen at the pew. Mm -hmm. So if you have them on a mini skirt, everybody's gonna see it. You know, we have about three offerings. So like you're gonna parade around the church often. In right. a Methodist church. So particularly at AME church. I'm not going to say all Methodist, but AMEs, we got about three offers. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, that type of, I guess, um, visualization became something else I had to socially negotiate. And then I was yeah. tired. I must have been tired of negotiating. So I was like, look, I'm, I'm not wearing a skirt. Right. To this is me. On. Right. I'm going to be me. I'm going to be free. Yes. And so I would, you know, and I'm glad that my parents indulged me um, and made accessible a lot of uh, 
stuff that I could wear to church that wasn't a skirt, but I continue to wear mini skirts probably every Tuesday and Thursday to school. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you were asserting, okay, you were asserting your, you know, your womanhood and you're forming your identity, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, so Damaris, can we get another poem? And I'm, I, and in the interest of time, yes. I want basically where I'm going is I would love to get another poem. And then I want to ask you about what you said in your intro, breath is both, because I'm thinking about the title of your book. And how does it all, you know, come together in the collection? And from your perspective, breath is both individual and profoundly communal, particularly in the form of language. That mm -hmm. very much mm -hmm. struck me. Um, so I want, I want to make sure before, definitely before we end, if you could bring us to that and the title and meaning of breath in, for the collection in Black Girlhood. Um. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a leap, and I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read one of the poems out of the back. Okay. Um, the in search of section. Um. So. All right. Um, I think I'm going to read Premonition 4. I haven't okay. read this out loud before, so. Oh, yes. Great. This is this is a premiere. <laughs> yeah. What, what page? The, what page? Uh, this is page 132. These poems were really hard, and of course, they required a lot of revision. OK. Um, bring back our girls, and these are for the girls in Borno. Premonition 4. The 2015 man is the mirror of a 1944 man. They resemble. Maybe 2015 is the great nephew of the Imperial commander. A Japanese man says only 20,000 women slush beneath cold men in order to love. Imperial soldiers in wheelchairs pick at their scars, reciting the nicknames of ghosts recalling the men they murdered one soldier sobs proof screams in ink and five witnesses turn into 410,000 women together you become a wave of warm bodies beneath a tsunami of imperial uniforms memory fires a grenade land dams break you cry so loud, your sisters are sure you are bleeding beneath a man wanting to love you, but left to love in the rice-filled battles. The, war, the world is at war with itself. Many are made to be comfort women. Calls over their faces are gall. You are the woman, women waiting in the wastelands, vast like oceans. You are the I'm sorry, vast like oceans, deep like generations in Korea, in China, in the Philippines, in Burma, in Thailand, in Taiwan, in Malaysia, in Vietnam, in New Orleans, in Port-au-Prince, in Rio de Janeiro, in Havana, in Miami, in Atlanta, in Lagos, in Luanda, in Porto Nova, in Uganda, in, in pra Praia, excuse me, in Las Vegas, in Los Angeles, in Brazzaville, in Accra, in Guinea-Bissau, in Morovia in Malia, in Dakar, in Freetown, in Juba, in New York, in Rome, in the District of Columbia, in Paris, in Berlin, in the cobblestone trenches of London, in every millimeter of the Vatican, Vatican, needless to say, in Florence, in Cairo, in Lexington, Kentucky, and even in the shipping crates in the port of Baltimore, at the piers of Hong Kong, in the Holocaust, the one in Germany, and the one the, the, of the Atlantic skirting the Americas. Diplomats want to comfort you. Women, lost souls, will tell you about girls, brilliant as suns. Their minds cast rays from their eyes and ears. Their pencils are emblazoned in a physics lab at an exam that will make them fit to fill wounds. Medical school will make each a doctor. 
who erases AIDS from the breasts of mothers and the mounds of flesh that form a lover. It's beautiful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you are, um, are you a history, uh, do you consider yourself somewhat of a historian as well, uh, Damaris? Um, I'm going to ask you one question. Can you see me moving? I cannot. Yes. Your, your, fa your, your screen is so frozen. Fr yeah, you're frozen uh for me, but everyone else can see you. Okay. All right. Because I didn't see the, the screen movement, so I was wondering. Um, I am very interested in history. What I'm not interested in is a linear, narrow negotiation of what happened told by people who currently possess power. Sure. Mm-hmm. I'm oh. not, I mean, that, that's why I became an English major and not a historian or not a history major. History was just too limited for me. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like the way that we objectify people we want to forget as if their humanity does not matter. Mm -hmm. And I felt like English literature did less of that. It yeah. still affirms the victors in many ways, but did less of it. Sure. Um, I also wanted to ask you the photographs, the black and white photographs that you have throughout your book, uh, serving as, uh, to me, markers in history as you are presenting certain um, subjects and, and landscapes and settings and, and all of that. And even your own photos, you know, there's a baby photo of you. Um, there's a, a photo of you as uh, a young woman or a teenager. And I wondered, why did you choose to not only have like all of your own photos? What was the, what impact did you want to have by weaving in, you know, historical photos and photos of Whitney and Aretha and with your own? Um, I just wondered about that artistic uh, choice. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a, a friend, a mentor, and um, another creative scholar that has a better way of saying this than I could ever say it. But she's, uh, Dr. Deborah Willis has written that black women are acutely aware of the power of photography and photos to be used as some pseudoscience and proof of criminality, inferiority, um, in the term in terms of like Sarah Bartman um, and eugenics movement, some subhuman stat status, right? And then she talks about black women that use photo archives in their art as a way of reclaiming the visual black body and snatching themselves back from that type of dim diminutive gaze. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think it's important as I'm telling my own story and the story of a community that I love to play with this idea of proof. So okay. sometimes I'm using it as a type of affirmation. Sometimes I'm using it very sarcastically and tongue in cheek to say America has told you that it's this and I'm mm -hmm. showing you that it's something else. There you go. Right? And so it's all of this type of, uh, it's, it's another type of way that I'm talking to, with my reader about our experiences. And it's another way of documenting the journey that the reader is taking with me in this book. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, and may we get another poem, and then may we end on your discussion of breath uh, as uh, individual and profoundly communal, and then lastly, telling us where we get your book, Dr. Hill, and all the ways we can support you and continue to follow you. Uh, 
um, sure. How are we? Are you okay with that? Are you on time? Or, or do we? I'm totally start? okay with that. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to read because I'm thinking about time. Oh, okay. I know what I'm going to read. I know what I'm going to read. Okay. So okay. I'm going to read 137, and it doesn't have a title, but it's entitled For My Niece and Her Bullies. Oh, okay. So it's the last poem in the collection. Mm -hmm. And this is for all my nieces and all my minis. My minis know who they are out there. Uh, I love the minis and the megas. And, um, you know, read the acknowledgments. You'll see who the minis are. So for my niece and her bullies, when they come for you, no, they will be creeping. Silence and secrets are weapons. Cry out the sacred names and contralto harmonies. Breathe centuries of terror. Your melodic shrills will shield you in Mahakali and will summon the homie warriors. When they come for you, know their lips will itch. They will hunger to kiss. Fight them. Let the whites of your eyes curse. They will be blinded by our chariots in your glares. When they come for you, know they will offer worms from their guts. Kick them. Invert their assumptions. Use your power. They will want to beat you, will want to sever hands and give their bodies over to dust. When they come for you, they will threaten you lonely. Remember our sacred names, the sharpness under your lips piercing your enemies, beckoning generations of blood. We will give you a red canal to cart your joy. This will be your carpet. You are our vanity waiting in their envy. You, our Calypso, you are our headwater. We will come, Dahomey, Mahakali, Black, Blue Winged Avengers, we are your angel armies. We will come charging in your veins, armed with stars. Remember that even your toes are heaven bound. Mm, beautiful. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I love that line, piercing your enemies, beckoning generations of blood. You know, in other words, you know, the ancestors coming for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for the hearts i don't know where they're coming from but thanks for the hearts thanks for the oh, love yeah thank you audience we still have a nice audience with us thank you for enjoying the words and poetry mm -hmm. of dr damaris v hill today on this saturday afternoon on nerdocity podcast okay and dr hill last but not least Mm -hmm. You said breath is both individual and profoundly communal, particularly in the form of language. Mm -hmm. How does that okay. connect to, uh, to Black girlhood and your, your collection? Well, I was thinking a lot um, about the ways, like just the technology of breath, particularly like in COVID and the Say Her Name um, I don't want Okay. Dottie? I'm here. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm am I back? I was thinking a lot about breath, particularly in this time when so many people are losing the ability to breathe in a time of say say her name. Mm -hmm. Um in a time Mm -hmm. when black children are, are being uh, murdered and 800,000 people are now dying because of this variation of SARS called COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and just thinking like, you know, black girlhood, you know, and all this time in the pandemic gives you a lot of time to reflect. That was some, that was some good times. The, the breath was better spent at that time mm -hmm. with, with spending time with people um, that didn't wish to poison me mm. or suffocated me, but wanted, wanted 
to be in community and uplift one another in a type of ring shout type of way. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about all the ways that um, breath is used when you're a little girl, as opposed to when you're a woman, sometimes we use breath to, to side disapproval. We mm -hmm. hold our breath. We hold so avoid, it. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So avoid saying something. <laughs> we hold it to look more beautiful. We suck in our breath. You know, we're trying not to snore. We're trying not to snort when we laugh. Mm -hmm. And all of that breath was much better spent when we were not paying attention to those rules. Mm. And um, when we were in communal ciphers, singing to one another, um, reasoning with one another, um, sharing joy with one another, singing along with one another, teaching one another um, how to survive and more importantly, how to live. Mm. Right? Like yeah. it's so much more than just surviving. That's right. Like how to live. Mm. If this, if Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood is a handbook on how to live, what, what is the one takeaway you want the reader and your audience and your supporters to gain um, from this wonderful new collect collection? Um, probably, um, there are lots of things, but I think about, again, number one, um, Black girls are not commodities. They are not expendable. They are wealth. Mm -hmm. um, they are human beings entitled to desire. And that at the same time, the ever present threat of hyper -vis visibility and sexuality on black girls isn't, isn't for them to negotiate and control. It is for society to relearn, to negotiate and, and control. So that uneven platform of having Black girls dress and behave in a way that we think might make them less uh, receptive to some types of vic victimization or exploitation in the world is in no way policing anybody else's desire. Right. It's only subjugating the girl where statistics and life experiences have proven that those things in terms of redressing and re and making yourself less visible and restricting yourself to certain spaces is not a form of protection. Right. Right. Because the same things, whatever they feared could happen to you wearing a mini skirt can just as, easily happen to you not wearing a mini skirt. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, someone has asked where we can rewatch this. This will be posted here for a while and then it will um, transfer to YouTube. Um, so, but immediately this will be here on the main page. Thank you. Yes, it Instagram automatically does. Yes, thank you. That's a that's a many asking questions. That's a what? That's a many. You have to read. That's a many. M I N I. You have oh. to read the acknowledgments. That's a many asking question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh wow, Damaris, I've so enjoyed talking with you. You are just you're one of my sisters, yeah. sisters in liter literature yes. and higher ed and. Um, I so admire you and your work and so thankful that you are uh, producing and you are a model for us and inspiration um, in, you know, how to keep going, you know, during this pandemic, keep creating, keep writing, keep affirming your artistic self. And so I really appreciate you for all of that. Um, and so now can you just tell us how we can uh, pick up our, our uh, copy of Breath Better Spent? And how would you mm -hmm. like for us to continue to support you and follow your work? Okay, so uh, please follow my, I have several Instagram pages. I'm going to get this together. 
I'm still <laughs> figuring out like the social media. So I have like Damaris Hill writer, Damaris Hill abound woman. Eventually those will collapse into one when I figure this out. Um, yeah, that, that one. Um, and then I have um, Dr. Digi Feminist, okay. which is more of a playful and personal site than having things about the work. I'm on Facebook, Damaris V. Hill. I'm on the Tick and the Talks. Damaris underscore Hill. I'm trying oh, to you on the tick talk. and the talks. I'm gonna have to find you on the tick and the talks now. Yeah, um, <laughs> there are a lot of book people on ticks and the talks. Okay, I that's why that. I'm on there. Yeah, hashtag book talk. Oh, yes, and hashtag book. black book talk. Say book talk. Wait, yep, and oh, hashtag God. black book talk. Oh, there are yeah. lots of readers on there. Okay. Um, and that's the only reason why I'm on there. Um, I'm on Pinterest. Um, Dr. Hill, I cannot see you. Where are you? I hear you, but I'm right can't... here. I'm right here. Hold on. Let me try again. Oh you know, my goodness! I keep goodness. flipping this camera around. All I see is a uh, um. Yeah, it just completely went out. Are you there? I'm here. Okay. Can anybody else see me? Can anyone else see her? Cause I don't. Oh boy. I don't see. Yeah. Is it going okay, out? I, I. I just don't see anything, but I hear you. So we can, you know, we can keep going. I just wanted to let okay. you know I couldn't see you at all. Oh, I don't. I don't know what's up with that. And it, it may. It may be. Um, the power is going short. So maybe okay. that. Oh no. Um, but oh, well, Dr. Hill, I want to let you know that one of the audience members, Ad Ad Adachio, I don't want to mispronounce your name, says thank you so much, Adachio Dr. Hill. You yes. Um, you are an inspiration, stayed right here and rewrote a whole short story. Miss <laughs> uh, Miss <laughs> Tara Nicole says thank you, Dr. Hill, sending love from Indy. Send the love um, back. Yes. And then you've had other, uh, there's other audience, Karima, too tat, who was really uh, commenting your whole, during the whole reading, various comments, very nice. Um, and so many others here. Um, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, okay. I appreciate and, you guys for coming. Yeah. And thank you. Okay. I want to say too to you too, uh, Dua. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you. Dua. It's I'm du sorry, Dua. Dua. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dua. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for always doing, doing the work that you do for us poets, talking to us, and uh, and and keeping us in the culture and the know, not just poets, writers, television. And just keeping your, your thumb on the pulse of us. I'm like, trying. That's, that's, I really am. <laughs> you're thank doing you. it. And thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And thank you for everybody that came. Keep breathing. Keep praying. Keep whispering prayers for each other. You know, love and light and all of that. Thank you so much. Dr. Hill, love and light to you. Have a blessed and wonderful weekend. Thank you again for joining me on Nerdocity Podcast. And again, thank you, audience. And please follow uh, Dr. Hill on all of her Instagram accounts, Twitter, <laughs> Facebook. And please pick up uh, her recent books. They are a joy to read and certainly a wonderful reference for any classroom or library program. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Bye. Peace, everybody.